property with respect of f1, f2, fn, writing it as a vector, and you will see that it will be the case. Now, if you put this equal to zero, you obtain the solution. And the solution is not very complicated. You can see that H transpose H, F equals to H transpose G. This equation, we call this, this is, if we solve this equation, we found the solution. Okay? And the solution, which is here, would be This is what is called the least square solution, h transpose h. h transpose h is, again, a square. If it is an invertible, if it is invertible, we can write and we have the solution. So it is interesting also to compare this with this. You have a kind of symmetry. You have here h, h transpose. Here you have h transpose h. Here you have H transpose at the other side. Here you have H transpose at this side. Okay? Okay, so we decided, we derived all these different cases. And now, is it possible to propose a thought which works all the time? This is, this is what, we, what we would like. We would like to propose a method that do not consider first case, second case, three, third case, and so on. We would like to propose something which is, okay, works every, every time, any time. It's a more general method. Yes, it is possible to do that. And uh, for that, uh, we need a little more uh, linear algebra. Probably you know about uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, singular values and singular vectors, okay? So in that case, if, if you are familiar with that, it is possible to propose a solution which works with all, uh, all, all the cases. Later, uh, I will propose another solution, not this solution which is based on singular value decomposition, but uh, first we have to go through this uh, singular value decomposition. Uh, all the things that I write here for the inversion can also be written for the identification problem, okay? Uh, let me check the time. Uh, we, we have the break now? Okay, so let's do a small break. And we were talking about proposing a method which can be used in all the cases. Uh, for this, we need to use uh, what the technique which is called singular value decomposition. Uh, we have uh, the matrix H, which has the dimension M by N. In general, we do not know if m is equal to n or less than or more than. Anyway, uh, we can always uh, form the matrix H transpose H and uh, H H transpose, which are which are uh, uh, square matrices. And uh, for these square matrices, we can always define the vectors u and the vectors v, u and v, uh, ui and vj, say, in such a way that we have lambda, uh, let me, yeah, no, no problem with that lambda. It is not the same lambda as the, the uh, Lagrange multiplier, but these are the eigen, uh, eigenvalues. And the same here. Vector u, ui are the eigenvectors of this matrix. 
vector v, vj are the eigenvalues of this matrix. Because these two matrix are related, they have the same singular values. Okay, but the numbers are maybe different. Uh, they have common singular values. And uh, you know that uh, uh, if we define a matrix U which is formed by the vectors Ui, U1, U2, and so on, and if we define the, ve the matrix V the same V1, V2, and so on, uh, then this matrix H, and if we define a diagonal matrix, which is the diagonal elements of lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, this matrix H can always be decomposed as U lambda V transpose. This is what is called a singular value decomposition of a matrix. Okay? Uh, I didn't wrote exactly, you have to check for the dimensions. I didn't wrote exactly I goes from 1 to and J goes from 1 to some other. You can check, but always we can write this. And uh, the matrix U and V are such that these matrices has the properties that U U transpose is equal to identity and V transpose V is equal to identity. And uh, in that case, uh, if we could define what is called generalized inverse. It is not minus one, but very often they put a, a, a cross there. This cross means generalized inverse. If the matrix was invertible, still you could write this. And if the matrix was invertible, H minus 1 would return what? Would be V transpose minus 1, which is V. Lambda minus 1. And U transpose would be like this. If the matrix H was invertible, then I could write H minus 1 equal to V transpose minus 1 becomes V due to this relation. U transpose minus U, U minus 1 becomes U transpose and I had this relation. If no, the matrix is not a square. This is, this is the normal inverse and what we can define which is generalized inverse is again the same U and V, but here I put the generalized inverse of lambda and this generalized inverse lambda, remember that lambda is a diagonal matrix okay, so lambda minus 1 would be lambda minus 1 would be diagonal of 1 over lambda 1 1 over lambda 2, and so on. Now, this generalized inverse is just diagonal of if the matrix was the full rank, the rank of a matrix is the number of non-zero eigenvalues or eigen uh, singular values. So, if the matrix was the full rank, in that case, all the lambda would be 
non-negative, uh, would be non-zero. And so we could go up to the end. No, if it is, if there are some of the values, we are going to rank lambda 1, we assume that lambda 1 is higher than, uh, greater than lambda 2, greater than lambda 3, and so on. We go to decreasing. So it means that somewhere here, we may have 1 over lambda k, and then we will have some difficulties. Because if they become 0, we cannot write this in general. So this, uh, this, inverse, uh, this generalized inverse of lambda is exactly 1 over lambda 1, 1 over lambda 2, going 1 over lambda k. And then, normally, here would be infinite. But in place of infinite, we put it 0. We truncate up to, just we truncate, we keep, we keep only this part. So it means that actually, in this expression, we can write only for all the lambdas, which is no more equal to zero, and uh, write this general, this is the definition of generalized inverse, which is defined again by Hadamard. Uh, there is a, a linear algebra book which explains uh, this more in detail. Uh, let me know, uh, try to use this, this is the generalized inverse of the matrix, and so I can define the generalized inverse solution. Let me write it here, generalized inverse solution, which is equal to H generalized inverse multiplied by G. Okay, so this is a, a way to define a solution which is not which is no more inverse in the classical term, is generalized inverse of solution of the problem. And if you detail know this, if you detail this expression using these relations that I have written here, you can write this as a sum over k up to 1 over k, k which is here, of uh, uh, what uh, will be here is lambda k here, here you will have, uh, let me check if I have to put u or v, I do not know, you will check it, probably is u, u i j, uh, u k j, and here you have v k. So this is the inverse solution, generalized inverse solution, which works all the time. But, could you, could you see the details? Yeah, let me go up and then back. So this is the solution that, but this technique, needs to compute the singular values and the singular vectors of, uh, of a matrix. And knowing that these matrices that we are going to use in practice are huge dimensional, this may cost a lot. Anyway, for now we are not talking about the cost of the computation, we are just trying to propose a solution, okay? A little later in the, in the future, we will see that even this solution, which is a generalized inverse solution, will not be helpful for inverse problems. So, but it is important to, 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 to see the difficulties, and you see what, what would be the difficulties if, that, if there are some of the singular values which becomes very low, very near to zero, then again we have the problems of stability. The third condition of stability, you can see very well from here. If all the lambda k was equal to 1, 
the problem was very well posed or very well conditioned. But if there are some of the lambdas are very high and some other lambdas are very near to zero, then we would have again the stability problem here. And we can learn here from this that, okay, what would happen if one of the lambda is equal to zero? We can see that the problem may not exist in that case. We cannot write the solution in that case. So this is the technique of singular value decomposition. And finally, what I propose to you, which is more easier to understand, is to combine this and this. We are going to combine this and this to propose a solution for you. So this is one, two, three, four, and fifth solution, final solution that I propose to you, is uh, at solution number two, we were trying to minimize this, okay? In solution number three, we were trying to minimize this. What if we try to minimize both? A combination of both. If I minimize this combination, I have, I have tried to minimize both of them. Okay? So, and this is the solution that I propose you to define a criterion which is a combination of the both and then to optimize it and define the solution as argument which minimizes g of f and this will work if I choose properly mu this will work always and I am going to show you that this will work always. So <coughs> let, let's see what would be the solution. Again, we compute gradient of g. No, it is easy because we have done the things there. The gradient of this part is this. The gradient of this part is putting equal to zero, we obtain the final solution that I am going to write, which is not very difficult, H transpose H plus uh, uh, two is going off, plus mu transpose identity minus one, H transpose G. And this is the solution that we obtain. If we, if we put mu equal to zero, we obtain the least square solution. Okay? Uh, actually, you can also write this equation in another form using the inversion of the combination of two matrices. You have matrix A plus matrix B, power minus one. This can be written differently, and you can obtain the first, first solution as a particular case when mu is equal to zero. Okay? So now you have the combination of the both, and if you choose mu different to zero, you have always a solution. Why you have always a solution? Because even if H transpose H is not invertible, even if H transpose H is not invertible, H transpose H plus mu identity will be, if we, have cho if we choose appropriately value of mu, this matrix can be, is, not can be, is always invertible. And so this solution exists always, and we can propose this as a final solution of the problem. Okay, so the conclusion of this uh, 
this part of the course was that, okay, we had an integral equation. In place of talking directly in the function space, function operator, we discretized the equation. We arrived at a linear system of equation. We proposed, finally, a solution for this linear system of equation, which gives almost always satisfaction. But not, not still the final point of the course, but <laughs> uh, we have uh, great advances in this, in this aspect. Uh, if any question in this part, no, I am going to talk. I, I have talked about uh, the convolution. We have talked about uh, image restoration this morning. And a third problem which will help us also to understand a lot of things was the tomography, computed tomography. I want to go a little more in details of these computed tomography equations. And then uh, we go back to the general case. So if you do not have any questions in, those, in these parts, I am going to switch to this uh, uh, computed tomography uh, application to go a little more in the details of Radon transform that we, we are going to use uh, later as the examples. Questions? Remarks? So for now, you, you saw that how we develop and we arrive at a final uh, proposition of the solution which is uh, in practice. Okay, let's uh, go now to... Now we are going to switch to uh, application uh, to giving some of the details of uh, computed tomography because uh, computed tomography is one of the applications that we are going to also mention all the time during this course. Uh, <coughs> computer tomography. Uh, you remember this morning that the main objective of the computer tomography is to see inside of a body. And uh, we saw that we are going to send X-rays. X-rays goes through the body. And we measure at the other side the energy received. And we can do these experiments in many places and turn, do again the experiments and turn and do again these experiments. And from all this data, we try to make an image of the section of the body. This is the tomography. So I am going to consider this problem by uh, designing this, uh, this uh, step by step. Here are the axes X and Y. And here is, say, the section of the body that I am trying to consider. So this function F of X and Y, this is what I would like to make an image on the screen. Okay? This is a section of the body. This function represents at any point x and y, at any point x and y, the value of f is the absorption coefficient. This absorption coefficient is related to the density of the material. If you have soft tissue, if you have bone, the coefficient absorption is different. And so they will look differently on the image, okay? So now consider that we have a source of X-rays. Energy is zero. This source of X-rays goes through the body. And at the other side, you have a detector. And this detector measures the quantity of energy received, which is I. The logarithm of I